everybody. Happy New Year. Um, I want to give everyone a warm welcome uh, to our members, our friends um, at Chatham House, where we've been convening on these big issues in international relations and conflict for over 100 years now. So thank, us for, thank you very much for joining us tonight to help us to continue that tradition. And indeed, this is almost a, a new tradition in that, to, to have this uh, annual meeting on the 10 conflicts to watch um, that um, Crisis Group produces every year. Uh, my name is Patricia Lewis. I'm the Research Director for Conflict Science Transformation and the Director of International Security. And I'm uh, delighted to welcome you back to Chatham House, uh, Dr. Comfort Eero, who is the President and CEO of Crisis Group, but the first time doing this particular new tradition. Um, so uh, before we begin, uh, a few important points. One is that the discussion is on the record and it's being live streamed. So welcome everyone uh, to the live stream. I'm, I've got a laptop here where I can see questions. And for those who do want to, answer quest to ask questions individually, please let me know that. That would be very helpful. Or if you want me to read them out, let me know that as well. Um, and for those who want to, we do encourage you to tweet and please use the hashtag CH events. And if you can, at Chatham House, give us a little bit of a, a shout out, that would be helpful. So this is a highly anticipated report every year at Chatham House, I think. Uh, the 10 Conflicts to Watch, which is published by Crisis Group. And there's no better person uh, for, for this than uh, Dr. Comfort Euro, who is the president and CEO of Crisis Group and who spent her entire career working on or in conflict-affected countries. And Comfort, you've been in post now for a year, <laughs> yes. right? But you first joined a Crisis Group in 2001, mm -hmm. and you've had a long association with mm -hmm. Crisis Group. Mm -hmm. You've also served as Deputy Africa Program Director for the International Center for Transitional Justice, and you've been Political Affairs Officer and Policy Advisor to the Special Representative the Secretary General at the UN Mission in Liberia. Mm -hmm. And of course, you have a PhD from our very close neighbors, the LSE. Um, and, uh, you know, we've known each other for, I don't know, I don't want to talk about how long. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it, it's a great pleasure to have you in this capacity Thank back you. at Chatham House. So Thank you really very much. A warm welcome. And I'm going to start by asking you some questions mm -hmm. and get into a conversation. And then we're going to open up to the floor because you will all think I've done a completely inadequate um, job of asking the questions. So I'm sure you'll have some great ones to ask. So I thought we'd start by um, you telling us um, about this year's 10 Conflicts to Watch. Mm -hmm. You know, how have we come up with this particular list? What's the methodology behind it? And how does it compare and contrast with last year's list? What's missing? What's uh, gone up the, the agenda? Mm -hmm. And how did last year's list pan out in terms of how good were your predictions? <laughs> I mean, Ukraine, yes, absolutely. So we'll give you that, but what about the rest? <laughs> Thank you very much. And really, um, it's a pleasure um, to be back here, but this time as capacity um, leading crisis group. And also thank you to Chatham House for continuing the partnership where we launched the 10 conflicts to watch um, over here. And it's really nice to see some familiar faces, um, Leslie particularly, um, our good friends here in the front as well. Um, let me start by explaining the methodology, um, because that, that really never necessarily changes. Um, and then I can do the compare and contrast and publicly hold ourselves to account on how well um, our assessments um, from last year panned out as well. I mean, it's, there's no science behind it. It's, it's, it's really a, a judgment um, that we take with our experts, our analysts throughout um, the regions where we where we work, and we look right across the the board, right across the, the the various regions, to get a sense of the various changing dynamics of the evolution of certain conflicts. Um, what is definitely at the at the top and never changes for Crisis Group, given our mandate, is that it's really about the number of people suffering, dying, the humanitarian um, imperative um, behind a number of these conflicts. And when you look at the figures by the UN itself, by the Office for Humanitarian Affairs, um, you begin to understand why 
um, it's not a surprise that some of the conflicts that we put on our list are there just because of the sheer humanitarian and human toll, and that's increasing, not decreasing, um, as we as we as we continue this sadly um, continue this watch list as well. But beyond that important um, um, dynamics, there are, there are I think when we look across the board and when we speak to our analysts in the various regions, whether it's Latin America or the Middle East region or Asia or, or Africa or, or Europe as well, um, there are at least three things that, that sort of um, that explain why we've got the, the 10, but also why we had the 10 of last year. The geopolitical significance is right at the top. And it also explains why twice in a row Ukraine is at the top because the, the, the fallout and the ramifications and the geopolitical significance of, of Ukraine. But it's not just Ukraine that has that geopolitical significance, whether it's Yemen, it's Iran, it's the Great Lakes region where you've seen a proxy war playing playing out, um, that explains why those countries are featured um, in our 10 conflicts this year. I think the other significance um, is where we see opportunities for peacemaking, uh, where we see opportunities to, um, to drive through or find a pathway to peace. So explains why Ethiopia was on our list last year and this year. Um, um, different positions, but nonetheless, it's on it's on the list last year. And it's also why Yemen also was on the list. What binds those two countries together was that there was a truce last year. Both of them broke down, and now we have opportunities again um, for for peace in Ethiopia. And a great deal of question marks over that, and we can talk about that later as well. The other reason I think that the other reason or the other methodology that drives um, um, our, our conflicts is also just the changing dynamics um, on the ground, ever flowing in, sometimes in the wrong direction, um, explains why Haiti is on the list as well. Um, sometimes going in the right direction, but oftentimes we see just the deteriorating um, circumstances as well. Also explains why we've put um, Taiwan on the list because we're warning about something into the future, even if we don't see the, the near and present danger today, there are trend lines that, that are very disturbing, um, particularly around major power tensions that, that then mean certain conflicts are intensified. Now to um, what we said last year and how we, I mean, I'm, I don't know if I'm the best person to, 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 to judge. Um, I mean, I looked at, I'm looking at the list now from last year as well. Um, I mean, I think the very first thing to say, British, is that even if it's not on the list this year, and even if it's on the list last year, it doesn't mean that that conflict is still not of concern. I think at the end, what, what drives our analysis is that we're saying to you that we're not saying that this is an inclusive list or this is an exhaustive list, but we are saying that this is the 10 conflicts that our experts believe that you should be paying attention to this year. That doesn't mean that because Israel-Palestine is not on the list this year that the troubles over there are no longer important. They are. Um, it also is just a sad reality that there's so much to choose from. Um, today, that there's just that that the the international peace and security landscape is going in the wrong direction. Um, we, you know, now we have a, a war in, in in Europe. The, the ramifications of that as well. So this is not a good moment to be to be to be talking. And that even though these are ten conflicts, they are simply what we believe you should be watching. But it doesn't mean that all the other concerns are off the table. It's also conflicts that we believe that are sometimes below the radar that we try to bring back onto the radar of international um, attention. And also, as I said, ones that we think requires concerted international um, action. The one conflict that a number of people sort of, last year a number of people asked us why not, why we didn't put North Korea on the list. This year I've noticed um, just by looking across what's coming through on the social media, a number of people have asked us why didn't you put Myanmar on the list? And there are good reasons why we should we, we should have included Myanmar. But you know, we also needed to think about other conflicts in the Asia region that are of concern to us. And Pakistan, therefore, was put on the list 
partly because of the political tensions in the country, but also just the, the dire consequences coming from the tremendous flood that took place in the country and the economic woes that accompanied that as well. So I'd be quite interested to hear people's perspectives, but that explains what's on the list last year and, and what's not on the list. The, my final point about the comparison with last year and this year um, is Ukraine. I mean, you know, sadly, for crisis grouping, you know, one doesn't want to boast about tragedies. But we were very clear last year um, that take Putin at his word, he wasn't bluffing, that there would be some kind of military adventurism, the scale of it, the depth of it, how long it would last, nobody could predict. I mean, some thought it would be a quick um, um, victory, um, but we were very clear that there would be some kind of military adventurism from, from Putin and the groundwork had already been laid in the years leading into, into that as well. Yes, I think that's a, a, a really good point. You know, I think many of us were very worried a year ago. It was mm -hmm. clearly hotting up. But I, I think the global ramifications of it, for example, mm -hmm. and this is one of the key things about the Russia's war against Ukraine, um, which I, I find, you know, we didn't really fully understand. Obviously, there were all the sanctions, which, you know, were mm -hmm. really important, but have all sorts of global ramifications. There's the issue of resources, mm -hmm. the issue of energy prices, mm -hmm. food. Um, so, you know, I, I was recently um, in Central America and became aware of, of how far away Europe felt mm -hmm. to me. And I think that that's very true um, for many countries around the world, even though it's having direct impact on mm. them. Uh, so, how do you think that? How do you think the rest of the world understands these these global ramifications, and will that change the way in which other countries that are far away? You know, we often ignore far away conflicts here, right? Yeah. Um, and it's not it's quite understandable that they would also not feel connected to a conflict in Europe. But given the global ramifications, how will that change and shift over time? Yeah, in fact, one of the, I think one of the most sort of glaring um, factors that emerged out of, or that has emerged so far out of Ukraine is just the extent of that ramifications and that there are different, there are different ways in which you, you can look at it. I mean, what you're pointing to is how the rest of the world outside of Europe um, has viewed it, whether it's in Latin America or Asia or, or, or Africa. And um, there's been a tendency to sort of lump um, a number of countries together under the, the, the Global South and, and speak of the Global South as having one voice. And then a number of people have talked about a non-aligned redux. A number of people have talked about a return um, to Cold War politics. A number of people have spoken about the West versus the rest. Um, and I think what is very, what is very clear um, is that the, you know, the, the way in which the West wants the rest of the world to view um, the Ukraine hasn't panned out um, in the same way. What I've been very clear about, at least when speaking about it um, from the so-called, and I say so-called so global south because we haven't found another way in which to, to explain it, although I think we should just talk about the regions in themselves. When I've been asked to think about it, at least from the Africa um, context, you know, I've, I've pushed back against some notion or some, some assumption that somehow um, a number of countries or the continent itself doesn't understand what is going on in, in Ukraine. So there is an understanding that this is aggression. There is an understanding that this is, this is an invasion, that this is a, this is a threat to um, the political integrity there's the sovereignty of another nation, and that those principles that are that are embedded in the United Nations um, Charter are not up for grabs. That none of these countries who may have a different view about what Ukraine means, they are not contesting these principles of political independence, of sovereignty, of territorial integrity. What, however, they are discussing, however, is about the double standards and about the hypocrisy. Um, some of them are also challenging this notion that why is it that you are insisting um, that we have to support you, um, what some of them see as a, a, a war between the West and, and Russia? Why are you insisting that we have to, to back that war? You never took the same sort of um, consideration for our conflict as well. 
um, when some people say, um, for example, that, you know, Mariupol, for example, is our Aleppo, it's not a surprise that you hear some of the countries in the Gulf countries turn around and say Aleppo is our Aleppo. Um, this is our crisis. When you ask us to pick and choose, we say, well, why, you know, why are you forcing us to take sides? We don't see this um, as, as a need for us to, to, to take choices. We have our relationships. We want to safeguard those, um, those relationships as well. The other thing is that Ukraine is coming in the context of of a period where um, there was a lack of, lack of solidarity, lack of international cooperation, for example, over the global um, pandemic, COVID-19. And you saw the fallout from the, 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 the vaccine diplomacy. Also, at the same time, this is coming at a time when a number of countries are asking for support over climate financing. So you insist that we support you, but when we ask for your support, you are not backing us. So that, and you've seen a lot of frustration, a lot of irritation by a number of countries um, that are outside of, of, of Europe as well. So, and I really do want to emphasize, it's not that a number of these countries do not see what is happening um, against Ukraine. They understand it as aggression. What they don't want is that you force them to pick and choose sides. And what they also want you to understand is that we also have national security interest. We also have foreign policy interest, and we're going to be guided by that and not by what you define those interests to be as well. And I think that's been an interesting, um, it's been interesting to watch that, but it's also been interesting to watch a number of countries feel emboldened as well to actually stare down um, the West and say, I, we want you to understand our own perspective on these issues. And then you've seen a rise of a number of countries, sort of middle powers, activists who feel that they too um, sort of have a position um, and that they want to also assert their own foreign policy independence. Like Turkey, visa. for example. Like Turkey. Yeah. Um, Turkey, interestingly, I, I th and I would put that in one, I'd put it in the camp of sort of middle powers, very activists mm. um, in its own position, um, played a very um, assertive role in terms of diplomacy in, in Africa, for example, has been trying to strike um, a balance between its position in NATO, its relationship with, with Russia, being one of the outside powers with Russia in, in Syria, but also playing a very important role in terms of the, the Black Sea yeah. um, grain deal as well. So it's, it's, you know, that's one of the, the rising middle powers and watching how it's asserted its own foreign policy, even on the question of, of Finland and Sweden coming into mm -hmm. NATO and how it sort of was very vocal in terms of its own demands vis-a-vis -vis the, the entry of those two countries into, into NATO. Yes, as well. exactly. Yeah. No, I, th I think that's, uh, that's been really um, one of the key things. And, you know, we're looking at also China and what China's learning. Mm -hmm. So China's been very interesting um, in response to this conflict. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's uh, looking at the disruption that Russia is causing. Mm -hmm. um, it has a traditional relationship but has been quite irritated, I think, by Russia and particularly the threat to use nuclear weapons, yeah. right? which has put China in a difficult position, India as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, China's been, it's, it's been actually interesting to watch and trying to assess um, how um, Xi Jinping and the rest of, of China um, has viewed um, Russia's invasion um, into Ukraine. You'll recall that, you know, ahead of the, the, the Olympics, um, Putin and Xi Jinping met. Who knows what was what he whispered into Xi Jinping's um, ear about how quickly he thought he could um, go into um, Ukraine and and do this in a very um, quick way. Certainly, um, I think this has become a headache um, for Xi Jinping. Um, certainly, um, it's it's a mess that he doesn't want to see. Um, having said that, uh, and what we we emphasise in the in the ten conflicts is that despite you know, his frustration or irritation or dissatisfaction in the way in which Putin has handled um, the crisis, um, he's not going to publicly undercut um, Putin and, and, the, and his war um, in Ukraine. He's also not going to compel or force um, Russia um, into um, any form of negotiated settlement. He's not going to make life easier um, for the West, for example. But at the same time, I, my sense, our sense um, in, is that, you know, Beijing is also not, want, is not going to want to provoke um, the West 
any further. And it's also interesting that both him and Chancellor, both Xi Jinping and Chancellor Schultz were very clear on the question of, of the use of nuclear um, weapons. I think that really did um, make Beijing um, very nervous as well. You know, and I think there, there are other sort of ramifications for China when it looks also um, in its own neighborhood as well, you know, and other sort of geopolitical ramifications tied to Taiwan, for example. You know, a number of people have looked, therefore, at how China would deal with Taiwan because of, uh, in the context of Ukraine, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, question marks about the, the heavy price that, it, that Xi Jinping and, and China would pay should it, therefore, mount some kind of escalation on, on Taiwan. It's seen the impact of the sanctions um, that yeah. the West has imposed very maximalist as well. Presumably taking steps to protect itself in the longer run. Taking steps to protect itself, not giving up on Taiwan, but yeah. necessarily taking those steps to protect itself, but very nervous so far about what it's mm. seen um, in, in, in Russia. And you made reference to, to India, mm. um, another one of those countries that we would put in that sort of middle power activist um, country, but another one of those countries that the West, in a sense, privately has been dissatisfied that, you know, India sort of kept that relationship mm -hmm. pragmatically with Russia in terms of arms. But at the same time, India is an important ally vis-a-vis, -vis, I mean, against um, um, uh, China as yeah. well. So the, the West may be sort of wanting India to sort of be in its own camp, and it's certainly there in terms of security and a, a close ally to the US in terms of security, but at the same time, India striking a very delicate balance, and also at the same time calling out Putin, saying, talking about the danger of war mm. at the same time. So again, it's that pragmatism that a number of these middle powers play according to their own national security interest and what makes sense for their own domestic and national mm. impulses as well. Well, maybe we could move um, and, and to look at Ethiopia. You mentioned mm -hmm. Ethiopia and Tigray um, yeah. earlier. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you, you've been flagging uh, this, this for, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen a real, uh, a lot of movement over the last year in terms of, of attempts at, at brokering peace. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you see the potential for uh, the, the, the whole peace process in, in Ethiopia and Tigray. Because, you know, the original um, attack, although there, there'd, always, there'd always been this, this tension and this, this dispute, but nonetheless, given the Nobel Prize, etc., mm. there, there was all this optimism about mm. that. And, and then it was, it, was, it was similar shock, in a way, to, to Russia's invasion of Ukraine to a lot of people. So how do you see the future of that going forward? And, and of course... The, the real importance of, of, mm. of Ethiopia in, in, in Africa and for the rest of the world. Yeah. No, one of the things I did last year, and I noticed he came into the rooms, Nick, Nick Westcott asked us a year ago sort of a similar question when the Royal Africa Society was having its own debate on the question of Ethiopia. And Ethiopia is a country that was both on our watch list last year and, and this year, and it's in the last five years been a constant priority for, for crisis group. I think the very first thing to say, and it, and I, it speaks again to the methodology that crisis group um, uses um, to guide the 10 conflicts, is that from a humanitarian perspective, in terms of the suffering and the violence, this is an important good news. Um, because what it's also, what has accompanied um, the peace, even if it's fragile at the moment, what has accompanied the, the peace is that it's led to an an opening of access um, into Tigray. Um, astonishing, devastating um, violence, sexual violence, devastation of in infrastructure, um, you know, starvation. Um, the return, if you remember, um, Patricia, in the 80s was dominated yeah. by, by famine and the idea that we were talking about famine again at a time when people were celebrating the birth of sort of of democracy or democratization in, in Ethiopia has been quite and devastating. Then there was a terrible Ethiopian Eritrean. Exactly. Yeah. So so this is so I think that we should also we should note that that's an important news. Now as to the the future and the viability of the peace process, I mean I I, in, I don't want to say it hangs in the balance, but there are a number of unresolved questions and a number of unresolved issues. We were very concerned 
um, when, when the peace, part one of the peace, I think it's safe to call it, was signed in Pretoria, huge sigh of relief. But there was a sense in which it was a victor's peace, you know, a victor's you know, um, outcome for Prime Minister Abiy. Um, the balancing of that initial um, um, settlement came in Nairobi um, when there was further um, talks and then, you know, what was put on the table then was that, you know, Eritrea um, would withdraw um, from, 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 from Tigray and Am Amhara, the region um, within Ethiopia, would also pull back. And there are question marks about, you know, whether the, the, the Tigrayans themselves will disarm and whether and how serious um, Prime Minister um, Isaias would be about withdrawing from, from, um, from northern Tigray as well. So there are a number of question marks also just about the sustainability also and the commitment of both sides um, in, in the conflict as well. So I think here it's really key and imperative that those who are guarantors to the peace, particularly African leaders, continue to pressure both sides, those who have direct access to both Prime Minister Abiy but the Tigrayan leaders. It's also important that we make sure that the humanitarian corridor is left open. It's good that there's now some domestic flights going into Tigray, but, but we're not out of the woods yet. Last year we had a truce that, 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 that quickly turned into a war. And now, I mean, I think the big, the big question mark now is whether, you know, Isaias can be trusted to pull back, whether the Tigrayans will, will disarm and whether Addis as well will keep faithfully committed mm. to Pretoria and the Nairobi peace deal as well. I mean, crisis group have people all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is one of the most interesting things about the way in which you work. You have people really plugged in, working on the ground, feeding back information yeah. that allows you to do this type of analysis. Mm -hmm. and, and so are there any, any other um, conflicts that you want to highlight? We can get into some more specifics, I guess, from the questions, mm -hmm. but are there any uh, ones that you want to highlight either in Africa or in other parts of the world that's mm -hmm. on this 10 conflicts to watch before we go to the floor? Um, yeah, thanks for, for, for asking. I mean, the, the other one, I mean, in the time that I've been at Crisis Group and much of that was as Africa program, um, director um, of all the conflicts that was that is sort of that that has focused on on crisis group was always the the Democratic Republic of Congo. Yeah. Um, it has never. To, I was trying to see if it ever appeared on any of our watch lists, and I don't recall it appearing on the watch list. And this is the first time it has appeared. And if you recall at the beginning when you asked me about the methodology and what guides us, it said one of the the key things that guides um, our decision um, is the, the geopolitical ramifications of any particular conflict. And here, it's not just the DRC, but it's the Great Lakes. And that region is back on the table for us in a very um, significant um, way. We are talking at a time where um, the country is, is, is on, the, on the eve of elections um, this year, where we're seeing the resurgence of the, the, the M23 um, form, former the sort of ex-Congolese um, um, army um, soldiers, um, mainly um, Tutsis, where the UN um, has reported um, that Rwanda um, continues to support um, this insurgency, and where Felix Tshisekedi, the, the, the president um, of, of Congo, is trying to reassert um, authority in the East and is brought in and welcomed Uganda and Burundi, and out of frustration, Rwanda um, sees this as a threat, both economically, politically, and from a security perspective. So we're watching the, the unfolding of, of a proxy war, and the region has decided to, to launch a regional, um, um, a regional force um, to intervene, to compel um, the insurgency, and this is a region that has already got a UN peacekeeping mission, and the UN peacekeeping mission is struggling um, in terms of how to, to manage the crisis. So it's one to watch, a very worrying one, because it mm. sucks in three mm. countries. You know, Kenya um, also, you know, following its own elections, finding itself having to both manage its own internal problems and deal with a regional um, consideration. So that's one that I would want to sort of emphasize. And then um, because um, in terms of, because of talking about peacekeeping, the other one to talk about is Haiti. And that, the reason I, I mention it is it was on our list 
last year and it's on our list um, this year. And it's a country that has really had a very, um, very difficult relationship with sort of the inter international community, with the UN particularly, and yet it's a country now that is turning back to the international community to ask for some kind of foreign force um, to help it compel gangs um, that are now, you know, who have got a strong foothold controlling much of the country. And that really puts that country in a very dire um, situation as well. So I really wanted to, to flag that. And the other thing that I, I think is important sort of to emphasize, um, and Patricia, and it runs right through the 10 conflicts and hopefully it can be, we can discuss it further in the, with the audience, is that despite um, the, the difficulties and the, 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 the very worrying trends that we're seeing internationally, um, multilateralism hasn't completely died. No, um, in fact, it, I think there's a re reinvestment. Yeah, in yeah there's been, a, yeah. And, and, and how ironic, yeah. you know, that, that a number of people are now defending multilateralism. You know, last year or the year before, you know, under the, the, the previous Trump regime, there was a backlash, you know, and, and we talked a lot about how dysfunctional mm. the Security Council is, and yet we've, we've seen in the last year or so that although, you know, there's been struggles and the dysfunction is still there in the Security Council. It's managed to compartmentalise, you know, a number of issues, and it's managed to the the the, the machinery is still working. And out of it, you saw a very activist UN Secretary General deliver um, the the Black Sea Grain Deal and other things that are very important, whether in, in terms of climate security or, or even in Ukraine. So it's not it's not all been bad and gloomy. There's still some things that are, are working though we can talk about the quality of the institutions. And as as, as Bronwyn well. pointed out last night, the mm. General Assembly has had a new yeah. lease of life as well. A new which... lease of life, you know, three times, I think, yeah. They, yeah. they went to the to Security Council. Yeah. In fact, you know, I had the, I, I took the opportunity to listen to Bromlin this morning because I knew I was I was coming here. Good, and one, good. Yeah, one thing I welcomed that she said um, um, was that it was important um, that if you wanted to ensure the legitimacy of these institutions going forward, um, that you made sure that it was more representative, you know, and her recognising the importance of the African Union to be part of the G20, and it's going to be a very significant year, um, with India also being at mm -hmm. the helm of the G20, and yeah. then you've got Japan also at the helm of the G G7, and that, how that's going to be very important in terms of reviving the relevance of, of these various multilateral bodies yeah. as well. So before we turn to the floor, and we've got a number of questions online, there's one question that's come up online, and mm -hmm. just answer it very quickly. Are the conflicts themselves arranged in order no. in the report? No. No. But, <laughs> but number course, one is Russia, number Ukraine. Number one is, is Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, and, and, we, and I said, because it, it encapsulates all those things that I said, the mm. geopolitical um, ramifications, the one that we haven't, um, talked about, and it may come up, is about the, 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 the nuclear risks mm. and escalation mm. associated with that as well. But but it's not in a ranking Don't order. Don't get but me started on that. No. Um, <laughs> but and Anna Nawaz was asking that, and I think mm. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. So yeah. it's mm -hmm. number one, and then the rest are pretty well in yeah. the top ten. You can guarantee that the first one is the one that's at the top of our concerns. Great. <laughs> right, so I'm, oh, well, you see, this is the thing about this thing. You always get so many great questions. I'm really looking forward to this. So I'm going to the front row, please, with the, with the woman there. Please introduce yourselves um, and use the microphone uh, because we have people online who need to hear. So it's not enough that people in the room can hear you. So please say who you are. So. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. I am Thea Tutberidze. Uh, uh, I'm a PhD student at uh, King's College War Studies Department. Uh, my question is uh, about, before question, I just want to say one thing. This war in Ukraine, I hope, uh, wakes the West. And uh, I really hope it changed many things because many conflicts, what we have seen, even in Europe, where have been supported by Russia, Yugoslavia, Georgia, and so on and so forth. My question is about, do you think there is any possibility of peace process in any direction without defeat, defeat Russia in Ukraine? politically and militarily. Thank you. 
Not so, Camford, do you want to take that? Because I think it, it's, it's a really important question to, to answer. Why don't you take that um, at the beginning? I'll go back to, to the floor. And if people just keep their hands up, I will ignore you. <laughs> <laughs> just to let you know that. Um, <laughs> Please put them up and down so that I can see at the time. Thank you. Do you want me to? Yes, I'll, please. I'll, okay. yeah. Good question. Very difficult one fun fun organization that you know always looks for a pathway to peace um one would hope that there will be a, a settlement that a, a settlement that also includes russia not defeating um russia you know i think a, a, a putin russia that's got his back to the wall that feels imperiled um that sees no way out is a dangerous um is a dangerous putin is a dangerous um, Russia. So I would, I would, I would hope there would be some kind of settlement. What that looks like, we can't go ahead of Ukraine in terms of what that looks like. I mean, I think Ukraine has been very clear on it on its mm -hmm. demands, but also Russia has been very clear on demands. I think the worst case scenario is one that 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 leads to some kind of victory. Um, you want a situation um, where the territorial integrity of y Ukraine is. is remain sacrosanct as well. But you also want a situation where you don't force um, the hardliners um, around um, Putin and, and those around him to, 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 to feel impelled, to, to can, push can harder. Can I challenge you a little mm. bit on that? Because mm. I think it's so important. So mm. in other words, essentially, the, the more dangerously and crazily someone might behave, mm -hmm. the more then we worry about them and give in to them. And what no, does that, that make not others what I, do the same? Yeah, and that's exactly. That, I'm so not absolutely you're not, not saying that. Absolutely not saying right. that as well. And I think that's yep. been one of the calculations that we've been looking at very, yep. very carefully as well. And you know, the the question that we've always looked at is is what is the risk of a nuclear escalation? And you know, Putin has been very astute at using that and dangling that in front of Ukraine and in front of the West. And the West hasn't shifted. Um, its own mm. position. The West hasn't changed its tactics. The West has continued. And crisis group, for an organisation that's about conflict prevention, um, that it's always looking for a way out, we've been very clear about the use of and the appropriate use of, of and supporting and providing those, new, um, those military weapons um, to, to Ukraine. We've also been clear about not going ahead of Ukraine in terms mm. of what a political settlement looks like. But at the, at the back of everybody's you know, consideration is is making sure that you can, as far as possible, um, keep um, Putin um, in the room and keep um, keep Russia in the room. I think there are four hard questions that right. we need to address, and and I, I see you're nodding your head. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. No, it right now it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't work. It's not yeah. Working. Mm -hmm. It's not working, mm -hmm. and it will not work yeah. if you mm -hmm. go well, Russia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so um, I'll take one more from the floor here, and then, oh gosh, it's so difficult. I'm going to go to the back, I think, just because I went to the front. So the woman at the back, please. Thank you. Thank you. Anna Joy Rickard from the Tony Blair Institute. Um, I focus on the Sahel, but I'm interested in looking at conflicts across the globe. And there's an interesting dynamic I find where Geopolitics is changing, the world is changing, and ties between countries are changing. And yet, when you look at a particular conflict, you'll see, as, as you're rightly emphasizing, you have the country leading that, the regional response to it, and then you have international actors, particularly the West, um, interacting with those conflicts. And often, that is based on historical ties. So in the UK, even in this room, although it's very international. In the UK, there'll be a lot more familiarity with certain conflicts that you're talking about rather than other ones. And I'm interested in how do you see that as, the West, as Western actors look at conflicts around the world? Um, do you encourage those historical ties where it's understood? Do you think there should be shifting and changing as geopolitics uh, changes? I'm interested in your thoughts around this. And then I've got, I've got another question um, from online who um, I'm not sure if you, if Kieran O'Mara, if you want to uh, speak or whether you're happy for me to read it out. So um, 
I'm not sure how quickly that can be done. Um, I'll read one. I'll read a, a, one more before we decide that. Um, and um, so, it, it, uh, oh, he can't speak. Okay, so Kieran, I'll, I'll ask your question for you. So, can this? Um, uh, to what extent is contemporary international order threatened by conflict, driven by ecological climate crisis? Uh, climate and human security have featured heavily over the course of the past few reports. And can you speak a little bit to this notion in relation to the conflicts in, mm -hmm. to watch in 2023? Thank you. And then um, I'd also um, like, if I can, to go um, to um, Mary Caldor's question, um, oh. if she wants to speak mm -hmm. later, and to Mariano Aguirre, who's online. If both of them can be prepared to speak, that would mm. be great. Mm. It's great to have you in to speak, if possible. Mm. So, mm. And of course, I'm sure you'd always want to take a question from both of those people. Yeah, so. that's great, yeah. And to the very question yes, the, please. Um, Thank you. at the back. Um, I mean, it's not, you know, when I look at certain conflicts across the world, you know, in Sierra Leone, the UK was the lead actor. And one of the things that Crisis Group said back, back then, back in, in 2020, that, you know, the US should um, step into Liberia because of its own historical ties there, because France also was involved in Ivory Coast. So often, and this was in terms of the Security Council, and you want in a lead nation um, to, to, and oftentimes those lead nations do have the historical ties that you were alluding to. I wasn't, I wasn't sure whether you were inferring that sometimes those former colonial powers are, are then become problematic actors in, in, terms of the, in terms of what we're seeing in the Sahel. I wasn't quite sure otherwise what the, what the question was that you were trying to, to, to ask. But oft, it's not a surprise that you see former colonial powers are the ones that are, are are the ones that are actually at the forefront um, of conflict prevention resolution or part of the problem as we've seen yeah. also in, in the Sahel or, and I can extend that to other regions as well but because you specifically mentioned the Sahel yeah, yeah. No, nobody can hear you online if you don't take the microphone mm -hmm. sorry thank you yeah, it's a question, for example, as the UK looks at various conflicts around the world as geopolitics shifts and changes, mm -hmm. but a government only has a certain amount of bandwidth and resources. Mm -hmm. So are we encouraging a country like the UK to, to keep looking at the evolving conflicts or does it need to choose how, how, do, how does a country prioritise? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. How does a country prioritise, especially when that country is also just you know, hobbled with so much domestic problems as well, you know, which is what's happening in the, in the UK, and I'll stop, and I'll stop there. And many there. other countries. And many other countries <laughs> as well, so I'll, I'll stop there because I may go down the and, wrong... And then, the, wrong so, then but so part of that narrative, of so, course, is climate change, yeah, where the UK that, has yeah. been taking quite a lot. And to be, to be fair, as well, although we got a little bit nervous in terms of was he going or was he not going um, to, to COP27 and all the pol unnecessary politics, about there and um, about that as well. So the UK has played an important role, and I hope it continues to play 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 that role. I mean, so climate change for the first time under my predecessor um, Rob Marley was put as a mm -hmm. conflict to watch, and I, I and I think you led the conversation did, yeah, yeah. then yeah. as well. And it's it's it it continues to be what I would consider um, to borrow Nick Westcott's line when we were briefing um, the UK. Um, you know, Nick talked about one of the most significant mega trends um, that we needed to keep an eye on, and certainly at least in relation to Africa, was climate change and climate security. The other mega trend being um, the, the COVID pandemic as well. I mean, we're not saying there's a di direct causal link between climate change and climate security, but what we are seeing is that in a number of fragile countries, um, but also globally, and this is not necessarily specific to countries that are at conflicts already, but we're seeing changing weather patterns and how that's mm. also impacted, and that's even in America or Europe. We're seeing floods and droughts, you know, Pakistan very devastating. Um, and we're seeing countries that are fragile, that are vulnerable, not having the resources, the capacity to manage 
um, the consequences as a result of climate change. We're also seeing, you know, think one of the drivers of, 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 of conflict, for example, in the Sahel, particularly also in Nigeria, the herd of farmer crisis is also about sharing land and sharing resources and how a country manages those resources. We also seen a very devastating situation today in South Sudan, where a flood in one part of the country forces people to, to move to another part of, that, of the country, which part of the country they move into, a country, yeah. a region that's already affected by and is already in the, in the midst of fighting as well. So it is it is also it's why we you know we have made a very big push for for actors to begin to understand the link between climate climate security and and fragility as well. Um, and then was there a was there another that was question? No, is no, that Mary's going question? on to okay. um, uh, uh, I hope hear from Mary Caldor and oh, Mariano mm -hmm. Aguera. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that they will be able to speak. I'm here. Oh, yes. Good. Nice to hear you, Mary. Can you see me? Actually, I just asked a question, and I don't know if you want me to say anything yes, please, as well. Yes, if you could ask the question. Uh, but they, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hey, okay. Here. So I was going to, so I will make a, I'll ask my question, but also make a comment on the negotiation point and see what Comfort thinks. Mm -hmm. um, the question really was when you were talking Comfort about, you know, people in the rest of the world who thinks, who do understand, and I've heard so many people say that from Jordan and from Africa, that Russia is the aggressor. The idea that at the same time you can't take, you shouldn't take sides seems to me quite contradictory. Uh, I completely share their views about the hypocrisy of the West. And when the West is calling for Putin, to be tried for the crime of aggression. I still would like to see Bush and Blair to be tried for the crime of aggression in Iraq, which really is the beginning of a lot of our troubles. So I think one can make that argument, but it seems to me that there's something strange about saying you don't then change, take sides. And that's what I find very difficult to understand because how can you not take sides in this situation? Mm. Uh, and the other issue, I would, it relates to that, was your exchange about negotiations. I think it's extremely difficult to have negotiations about political outcomes because precisely for the same reason that Russia is the aggressor and it's occupation of Ukrainian territory is just unacceptable. Um, and, and also, it's impossible to imagine that there is a solution that's satisfactory to both sides. But on the other hand, there are actually negotiations going at, mm -hmm. on, which I think are very interesting. Mm -hmm. For example, over the Zaporizhia nuclear plant, and, you know, I was just hearing that Ukraine, it, it's sort of stabilised because of the presence of IEA. -E. Yeah, exactly. Similarly, there was a real achievement, the agreement about exporting grain and overcoming the blockade. And there are lots of lower level agreements on exchanges of prisoners, evacuations of civilians. So it seems to me there is an area for negotiation, but we need to draw a distinction between what might, one might call humanitarian negotiations and sort of top-down peace negotiations. And that probably applies also to Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. But it's a sort of general point, really. Sure. Thank you, Mary. Um, I'm going to turn now to Mariano Aguirre. Mm -hmm. uh, to, he, he's looking at the abandonment. So, Mariano, <coughs> um, if we could... Yes, you, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you very much. Um, well, thank you for this event and thank you for the presentation. Uh, do you think, uh, Dr. Ernest, that Haiti is an example of uh, what I consider a strong trend by the big and medium powers to abandon countries that have no resources to offer and that their domestic situations at the same time seem impossible to manage. And, and for medium powers in this case, I would like to, to, to remember that some years ago, a series of countries in Latin America, they decided to 
to go against some kind of taboo in Latin America, and they uh, build it up um, a, 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 a a, an intervention in Haiti under the UN flag, uh, uh, led particularly by Chile, uh, Brazil, and Argentina. But in this moment, there are no countries at all, starting with the US and the Latin Americans and others, to be in, in Haiti and to implement any kind of intervention with all the difficulties, of course, that an intervention in a country now dominated by gangs could have. But I would like to, to have your opinion about it. And by the way, listening to, to Mary Calder, I, I think that there is a kind of parallel in this moment um, with this trend against any kind of negotiations in Ukraine and against any kind of intervention in Haiti. And uh, perhaps it's just uh, I'm wrong, but I think that there is something similar at, uh, in these two kinds of, of negative positions towards their uh, toward this kind of situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariano. Yeah, those are really two very um, good questions, and I really want to um, sort of acknowledge Mary's important point, talking about moments in which we have seen um, humanitarian um, negotiations, and those were hard worn. They weren't. They weren't easy. Those were highly. We, we, we label them humanitarian, but they are highly political mm. and highly sensitive. And it wasn't easy to get that Black Sea brain deal, for example. It wasn't easy to get the prisoner um, swaps, for example. And it required a, a combination of players. Turkey being one, Saudi Arabia being another. So we, while we label them humanitarian. They were highly political in terms of getting that 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 going as well. So and it it goes back again to to the to the point um, that you were raising. Um, but on the issue of of taking sides, I, I really want to emphasise um, again um, that a number of those countries who people assume haven't taken sides are very clear on the principles. Um, they're very clear on the on the issue of the of the aggression. Um, let's not forget also that we saw the votes go up higher after the annexation um, referendum. And that, that was taken back to the General Assembly and a number of countries who initially abstained um, back in the very first um, General Assembly vote in March then voted um, um, against um, the annexation and made it very clear that they considered that aggression. Let's also, also forget that the, def that, the, that the most vocal defender um, of multilateralism and who spoke um, in defence of, of the UN Charter came from one of the Global South countries. It was, it was Kenya. So, you know, Kenya had taken a, a, a very powerful speech. Extraordinary yeah. powerful yeah. speech. So th what, what these countries <laughs> are saying is that if you recognize these principles of sovereignty, mm. of, of, of our political independence, we, we were born out of these. Don't forget that we were under colonial tutelage. So the notion that we don't believe in these things is, 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 a fa is a fallacy. But if you agree about sovereignty, if you agree about independence, then you'll also agree that it's my right as a country then to define what my foreign policy looks like as well. So I recognize and I defend Ukraine's territorial integrity, but, but you don't get to push me in one direction, um, in a direction that I find questionable um, as well and that doesn't necessarily um, fit my imperative. But that doesn't mean that I support Russia necessarily. I'm also pragmatic. I have my reasons for now. Now, there are some countries, um, however you want to label them, and there are some countries who, are, who have tied their, their lot to Russia for security reasons. We're watching very clearly what's happening in Mali, and what is happening in Central Africa Republic, you know, where they've relied heavily on, 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 on Russian mercenaries in the form of, of, mm. of Wagner. You know, we've seen also that those countries who have got an anti-West um, impulse, you know, we've watched the self-interest of some of leaders who are seeking to survive and assume that Russia would somehow be an alternative security umbrella where France, for example, hasn't been as well, and, and recognize those countries and, and, the, and the, the problematic positioning that they've taken vis-a-vis -vis, um, Ukraine. But I just want to un underline that, um, that we shouldn't ignore the reasons and the choices that, that, that countries make. You know, if you, the shoe was on the other foot as well, you know, <laughs> 
Um, you know, you, we were talking earlier on about the anniversary, for example, of, of, of Iraq, and there are people who generally are concerned that the same chamber that has labelled Russia an aggressor is also the chamber of other people that may, may also be called aggressors as well. Mm. So this just is to the point Mary that. was making as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, on Haiti, I also completely um, um, agree. I, yes, you know, Haiti is one of those unfortunate... Um, um, countries and it's and I said the irony is not lost on any one of us that you know Haiti one of its legacies the UN's most troubled um, country and a, and a, you know a very bad legacy for the UN and now having to com contemplate um, not not a UN led but maybe a UN recognized um, you know foreign presence of sorts and the fact that the region itself is holding out and the fact that the region itself is hasn't sort of given a green light to to any form of foreign forces tells you about the predict the predict the predicament of the region as well but also it's a reality of just the complexities of trying to intervene <coughs> to deal with criminality banditry and gang and and, and gangsterism mm -hmm. you know in an urban setting you know what kind of forces what kind of troops what kind of you know, what kind of elements can you put into that situation and hope for a good outcome? So it's, it's a difficult um, conundrum, but, it, but it's the, the, the gravity also is not lost on a number of countries. But the US is not going to do that. It's checkered history means that it's not going to, to play, that, mm. um, play, that, play that role as well. Thank you. I'm going to go back to the floor in here, um, but I do want to ask if um, two <coughs> speakers online could come in towards the end, which was in about seven minutes. Um, one of them is Shelley Dean, and the other is uh, Duff Mitchell, um, and see if we can um, go to them at the end. So um, I've now got to be aware that I've gone to that side, so I've got to go to this side. So I shall go to this gentleman here, please, thank you. Please, please, um, could you not keep your hand up the whole time? Thank you, because it's, it's very disturbing for everyone else, thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much for your talk this evening. Um, Commander René Valletta, uh, Royal Navy, just uh, working over in the office of the head of the French Navy at the moment, over from Paris. Um, my question concerns uh, one of the contents you haven't really spoken about, and I just wanted to know what your thoughts were. And I can't criticise your 10. You have to have 10. There are a lot out there, so mm. you've got to keep it down to 10. Um, the events in South America, in particular Brazil and Peru, um, do you see them as flash in the pans, or do you see them as embers potentially to make the 2024 list or beyond? Great, thank you. Um, I'll take um, a question at the back there, please. Thank you, in the middle. Uh, good evening, uh, Adam from Holocene and Impact Capital. Um, I don't know if my question is as important as others, as I haven't raised my hand for half an hour, but. Out of character for myself, I'm going to be a bit optimistic. Uh, is there a conflict you're most looking forward to or potentially <laughs> seeing resolved? Let me finish, let me finish. <laughs> potentially being resolved in the years ahead with a lasting resolution in, the, in that sense, looking forward to. Apologies for the, uh, the phrasing on that one. <laughs> Thank That's you. great. And, and to the uh, gentleman in white, just to go to Ewan, please. You can wave the microphone. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you very much indeed. Um, the name's um, Ewan Grant. Uh, I'm ex-UK law enforcement. I've worked in Ukraine, Liberia, Yemen, and Somalia, and I've given an endorsement on the back cover of the new edition of Damien Lewis's Operation Relentless, which covers the African Great Lakes region from the 1990s. My question is largely based on that. Um, what basically has the UN learned about improving uh, resilience and contingency planning? Uh, the reason I say that is I, I first identified Wagnerism nearly 25 years ago and it's been in plain sight under the eyes of the UN for decades now. And it raises very serious questions about whether the organization can cope 
and wants to cope and is up to the job. Thank you very much Thank indeed. Thank you. And then we've got two questions at the end. Um, so that just means you've got to be very quick. Yeah, OK. <laughs> um, flash in the pan, Brazil, Peru. You know, when, when we, um, when we um, did our 10 conflicts to, to, to watch, we also um, did another one um, on sort of conflicts to, to, to hope what we, areas we hope as well. Um, Brazil, we, I don't think it's a, I think it's, well, I don't want to say it's a flash in the pan, it's dangerous to make a prediction um, game. But what we did say also, not in a 10 conflicts to watch, but in the, in the statement that we issued um, this week, um, was it, it was, it was a devastating, shocking, but not a surprise, because the trend lines were already there. Bolsonaro himself did not accept, did not recognize Lula's victory. His own um, hardline supporters themselves had been all making a lot of murmurings that they were going to um, that they were going to sort of push back against um, against the the vote. So there was always a question about um, the the smoothness of the of the transition as well. But one of the things that was that, is, that was never lost and was never lost even in the years um, under Bo Bolsonaro was just the, the way in which key institutions, the constitution, mm -hmm. the rule of law, and even civil society held together to protect some, some key, key, um, key, key principles and, and key institutions. So I think that's one important point as well. The other important point, and we, I mean, we're still looking at the polls, nobody knows what the outcome is yet, but what is beginning to emerge is that even those who did support um, Bolsonaro condemned the, the assault on the institutions as well. Some of them have come out quite vocally to say that they, that, that they distance themselves from what's happened as well. Um, and, you know, Lula's own sort of po posturing as well, it's not, it's not as though he wasn't aware of the possibility that there was going to be some kind of real pushback against his, his, his victory. I, wouldn't, I, want, I don't want to project already what's going to go on our 2024 list, but Peru is an interesting one. And I would put Peru in a category along with Lebanon, but also Sri Lanka and also Pakistan of one of those countries in terms of the, the global ramifications um, of, of fallout from Ukraine in terms of commodities, in terms of food insecurity, and in, just in terms of the share um, economic um, um, impact on a number of countries as well. And I would also attach a number of countries that now facing um, serious debt, a number of countries that we, we thought were going to be the bastions of, of economic growth in their regions are now suffering the knock-on effect of a, of a hardened economic um, downturn mm -hmm. as well. And I, but I, again, I don't want to project what could possibly be um, on the list for 2024, but I think the Latin America region um, is one to watch, both in terms of the rise of left-wing um, rulers, um, and that's not to say that those those left-wing rulers will not have or follow the same playbook as we've seen some right right will um, link right-leaning rulers in the in the region as well. I think we'll see the same. So this is your trailer for yeah. next year's report. Well, right? no, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> um, to to answer uh, my my our friend at the back, I I there are there are there are some countries, some regions where we do see hope. And as I said at the beginning, our methodology also includes. Um, um, those conflicts that we see opportunities for peacemaking and those conflicts where we see the potential um, for, for peace, which is why Ethiopia and Yemen um, both appeared on our list last year and this year. If there is um, robust um, regional diplomacy um, and if there's, is, if there's very clear um, intention to try to secure a truce. There are bilateral conversations taking place right now between, for example, Saudi Arabia and the Houthis in, in Yemen. Will that lead to uh, a very clear intra-Yemen conversation that is necessary to happen? Can the, can, um, the SRSG Grunsberg help accompany that? These are all big questions, but it's one that we're watching with some, with some hope, even though the trend lines also for war are, are, are there. And I would say the same for Ethiopia, even though that's just a very difficult um, one. The UN question is a good one, it's a big one. Um, but, you know, and yes, peacekeeping is struggling, peacemaking is all the, all the, key, all the key institutions are struggling. 
um, and the UN is part of that, you know, but it, it's also been resilient. And oftentimes we take all these crises to the UN because there's still some idea that the UN is an important multilateral agency despite how dysfunctional parts of it is, is. you know, the humanitarian agencies still play an important role, the development yeah. still play an important role. So I wouldn't rule it out, but I also recognise um, the question that you're asking, and it's an, an important one as well. So we are over time, mm -hmm. um, but I am going to go to uh, our two speakers. So she <coughs> Shelley Dean can't speak, unfortunately, which, mm -hmm. as she said, is a rarity. Um, but um, she uh, wanted to um, ask you about, can we identify newly discernible trends and tendencies mm -hmm. in conflict escalation over the course of the crisis? crisis group maybe that's one for the yeah, future and the then future. Um, and then mm -hmm. I'd like to and, and with connection with that I'd like to go to uh, Duff Mitchell mm -hmm. um, or Mitchell Duff I'm not sure which way around that is excuse me if I've got that wrong um, but um, please if, if you wouldn't mind speaking um, and asking your question for the last one uh, yes can you hear me yes can you hear me Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so it's Duff Mitchell, Chatham House member, speaking to you from Canada. Uh, my question has to do with methodology uh, for your your uh, your list. Um, with respect to conflict methodology, could the crisis group be undercounting conflicts when it focuses on individual conflicts as opposed to cluster of conflicts? For example, while individual conflicts in Nigeria may not rise to the level of other individual conflicts elsewhere, would not the fact that there are multiple security threats throughout the country with insecurity threatening the very viability of the state require that the country be put on a watch list? Thank you. Thank you. And yeah. indeed, in, you know, in other reports, you've mentioned the Sahel, for example, yeah, as a yeah. region. The, the one thing yeah. I would say, just in terms of methodology, is that the other thing that Crisis Group does is that we have this 10 conflicts to watch, which is global. In a few weeks' time, we will issue um, European Union global conflicts to watch, which are for the EU partners. And it goes back to a question that our friend at the back asked about lead nations. And these are ones that we think that the EU itself um, is in a good position yeah. to drive as well. And then we have another set of watch lists that is for the Africa Union, when we believe that the Africa Union could play, play a role. So this is why I say that you know we have the 10 conflicts, but there are other conflicts that we're watching. And Nigeria, for me, um, you know, elections this year, multiple security crises. You said it, your, your, the speaker himself said it very clearly. The, the fact that Nigeria is not on the list does not mean it's not a, of concern um, to, to us in, in crisis group. And every single, you know, every single year we write on, on Nigeria. We don't miss a beat um, on Nigeria. And in terms of the conflict trends, um, we're, we're living through them um, mm. right now. I think one of the big ones, the big, the big mega trends that that really trans, um, transcend multiple borders. And I, here I will bring back the, clump, the climate security mm. um, is another one. But the other thing I would say, and I would like to live on a slightly note of optimism, is that despite all of this, and we've talked and Bronwyn mentioned it herself yesterday about, about you know, international institutions, is that one of the important things that has emerged is that in Interestingly, we've all come back to multilateralism as a way out of some important crises. And despite what we may say about the UN, it's still become an important and vital centre. But other, other important vital centres, the G20, the, G, the G7, have become important factors because of the ascendancy of middle powers mm. like Brazil, like Turkey, like, like Saudi Arabia. They've, they've become important players and we need to keep an eye on them mm. as well. So. Well, well, comfort you didn't disappoint. Oh, <laughs> it's a tour de force, uh, mm -hmm. slightly over the hour, but I think I Sorry. have a sense that we could have gone on for longer with the questions um, online as well as in the room. Thank you so much, Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. for putting yourself with these 10 conflicts to watch. Mm. I think that we need to do an integration over the, like, the last five years and <laughs> I would love to do a bit of analysis mm -hmm. of what you got right, what you got wrong, mm -hmm. and um, you know what is still there yeah, that, that exactly. needs to, to keep on. But you know, it's such an important thing to do, and that you know, ability to be able to sort of put these ten conflicts down and make us think 
is the most important thing to make mm -hmm. us think about what those are, um, the underlying trends, um, how we might solve them, because mm -hmm. that's a critical yes. component. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for thank coming you. again. Um, or, or rather, thanks Crisis Group for coming mm -hmm. again. Thank you for coming uh, in your capacity now thank as CEO. Much. So really brilliant. And please join thank me in, in thanking you. Thank you.